For 30 years, Raydel has been supporting Aussies by providing health products from naturally derived ingredients to enjoy summer with health confidence. Raydel, the brand of choice by Mitchell Stark and Elisa Healy. Raydel.com.au. Four minutes past eight o'clock. It's a very good morning to you. Matt McCowden is going to join us very, very shortly. We are at SENSA Studio Lumo, number one King William Street in the heart of the city. And for the first time in about seven days, it's not windy outside, so you can enjoy that and you can join in with us this morning on 1300 736 736. Annie has given us a, bu- a buzz and she wants to talk about the great Russell Ebert. Good morning to you, Annie. Good morning, boys. Love to Lucy and the boys, Kane. Thank you, Annie. Um, I absolutely love this show. I tell, I've got to say that. Um, but yeah, I'm just uh, driving at the minute um, down from the Barossa to um, Alberton Oval to say goodbye to the greatest footballer I've ever seen play in my time. Um, And it's just going to be a very, very sad day for the Port family, but also to um, remember his remarkable feats Mm. on the footy field that were magical and sometimes just bloody extraordinary. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, Eddie, so it's... If there's one thing that's been, I suppose, I call it just amazing to watch over the last few few days, it's just so much a vision of Russell and just how good he was. From from your seat, why, why was he so different? Why was he special? Um, I, it was just his um, like his ex, it, his explosiveness when he got the ball and and some of those handballs that he used to dish out. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do anything like that. I know it's a different era now, um, but, you know, as far as the old school footballer, um, probably showing my age a little bit here, mm. but um, I used to watch him with my dad and um, we just used to marvel at the things he, he did on the footy field. Um, but I think he'll be, be best remembered. Might have just dropped, lost any... Oh, they've got you back now, Annie. Yeah. What's that, sorry? Oh, you just dropped out for a brief second, but go on about you saying how he will be remembered and his lasting legacy. Yeah, is is work that he... The, the things that he did for everybody else, mm. like nothing has ever been about Russell. It's always what he can do for somebody else. And he's just a remarkable and very, very special human human being. So it's going to be a sad, sad day. It will be uh, one of the saddest. Absolutely well said, Annie. Thank you for sharing your memories of the great Russell Ebert with us this morning. Gates open at 9 o'clock from Alberton. Um, it will be chaos down there, so best it would be to arrive as early as you can. Funeral gets underway at 11 o'clock at the great uh, Alberton Oval. Joining us now, Hazy, is the host of the driver's seat, Matt McCowden. Matt, thanks so much for your time. Gents, good morning. Take us through the events of the weekend because there was a bit of argy-bargy. Um, what is the latest? How good was that? I mean, that's what we love to see in a bit of sport, a bit of controversy. And uh, the racing of the last three weeks at SMP has been mildly pedestrian, put it that way. Uh, and then finally, over the weekend, we had a bit of argy-bargy, as you say, between the two, uh, the two teammates at Triple Eight Racing, Ampol Red Bull Racing. And the, I think the, the most interesting thing about it is Jamie Wincup um, was basically ignoring team orders from the team manager, uh, uh, Mark Dutton. And interestingly, Jamie Wincup retires at the end of this year to become the head of Ampol Triple Eight Racing uh, next year. So it was all a very interesting situation. Is this is this unusual in, in supercars, Matt? Because uh, this uh, you see the sort of plot in F ones and all sorts of things, but behind the scenes, is this rarely happen on Australian soil? Yeah, it does very rarely happen. Um, very rarely do we see a driver disobey his team. Essentially, um, although Jamie's got good form in this area, we've seen it at Bathurst on a number of occasions where um, Mark Dutton, the team manager, has come through and said, hey, Jamie, you need to you need to slow right up or you're going to run out of fuel and you're not going to cross the line or you're not going to make the end of the race. Completely ignored 
uh, Dutto, and in the end, he, he indeed did actually run out of fuel and, and uh, didn't cross the line. So Jamie's good for, for ignoring uh, his team orders. In fact, even Dutto came uh, across the TV at the end of the day and said, I reckon I might even have just lost my job because he couldn't keep control of these boys. But it was exciting. It was it was a bit of a... There's been some underlying tension there. But, you know, at the end of the day, Jamie got out of the car and said, you know what, I retire in a couple of races' time. There is no way when I'm chasing down the front guy that uh, I'm going to get out of the way. What it did do, unfortunately, is stop or prevent both he and Shane Van Gisbergen from being able to catch young Will Brown to take the victory. They were too busy squabbling with each other and that just allowed Will Brown to scamper to a victory. So tell us about that uh, between Wincup Wincup and Van Gisbergen, as you said. They clipped each other a couple of times. Did did it get at all dangerous matter? Of course, it's always dangerous, but there's different levels of danger. How dangerous was it out there on the weekend? Nah, danger. I I, I wouldn't in, in any way, shape or form say that it was dangerous. I mean, it was dangerous to their championships. It was dangerous to their results certainly wasn't dangerous to the health. Um, these guys are, you know, in the top 5% of drivers in the world. Our touring car category is one of the best in the world, one of the toughest. And so they know where to push. They know where to press. They know where to put a bit of pressure on, push someone a little bit sideways, do that sort of stuff. What would have been even more, I, I suppose, controversial is had they had each other off, had had one or either of them really given each other a clip and thrown each other off the road, then that would be a whole different conversation. But it was just very good, tight, close racing. And I think as fans, that's what we want to see. We don't want to see, okay, mate, pull over, let your teammate go. We want to see a, particularly two of the best, a seven-time champion, a, a former champion, and now a, about to be a two-time champion in Van Gisbergen, really push each other to the edge and we want to see tight racing like that and we want to see teammates having a real crack at each other because if we don't as i said it just makes the whole thing look a little pedestrian is this purely just something that you leave on the track or is there reports matt that uh perhaps jamie and shane don't quite get along away from it all no, they get along well. What wouldn't have been fabulous, what would have been mildly awkward yesterday would have been the team debrief. Um, you know, as I said, they, they, they probably stole, uh, they, they stole defeat out of the jaws of victory on Sunday. They had the pace to overtake Will Brown and they didn't do that. And, but there would have been a fairly awkward conversation on Monday morning between Roland Dane, the current owner of the team, um, uh, Mark Dutton, the two drivers, the engineers, to sit down and say, "Right, oh boys, come on, let's not do that again." Particularly with the biggest race of the year coming up in just a couple of weeks' time, let's just settle down, let's get it together because we don't operate like that. So that would have been mildly uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, Jamie's about to become Sh- uh, Shane Van Gisbergen's boss next year, so <laughs> um, he'd have to keep his his lit buttoned somewhat because next year it'll be Jamie calling the shots. Yeah, it's a, an amazing situation and you just wonder behind the scenes <laughs> if he did manage to uh, keep a lid on things. Um, silver lining, nice to see Will Brown get his first win because uh, what we did learn is that he's uh, quite a young character. Oh, he's been threatening for weeks. He's been fast, consistently fast. He's been dormant pace all year and as we've come to the final four rounds at Sydney Motorsport Park, which complete uh, concludes sorry, this weekend... Uh, he's shown pace all the way through the build-up. Unfortunately, his team at Erebus have duffed it in the pits. Every time he seems to have serious pace or in the lead or threatening for a win, he's had an issue in the um, in the pit lane, which has unfortunately halted his charge to the front. So uh, it was great to see him get that victory. As I say, he's been threatening. He's a huge character, big smile. People sort of talk about him being the new Craig Lowndes, uh, the new... Uh, Scotty McLaughlin so there's a there's a bit of a vacuum there for him to fill and if he can keep up this form uh, he's got good pace the team can keep it together he and and um, his co-driver and that team could be a bit of a darkie for for another Bathurst victory. Sounds pretty impressive as well 23 year old he's a car salesman and a pilot Matt now some people just too talented for their own good don't you hate that? Yeah. Uh, and you're right, he's got a great personality and everything he turns his hand to, he's been successful at. He had a, an incredible junior career. He came up through 
Formula Ford, Formula Four, Toyota 86, Super 2, won all of them. Uh, so he's he's got good championship winning form. And I think that's why at his age he was uh, only after two years of Dunlop Super 2, I think it was two and a half years maybe, he was drafted into one of the top teams at Erebus. And he and his co- uh, his teammate, um, Kostecki, they are just working beautifully together. So there's a really happy, it's happy land at Erebus right now. And I think it's showing in their results. As I say, they've just got to make sure that that, uh, that, that pit stop um, action and the way they load the wheels onto the cars during a pit stop is correct because um, it can have a big effect if it doesn't. And we've seen that effect, unfortunately, for Will in the last couple of weeks. But uh, it all came good on Sunday. He took his maiden victory, did the burnouts, which we all like to see. And it'll be interesting as we come into our fourth round at Sydney Motorsport Park this weekend, whether he can keep up that form. Uh, just like you said, there's still a bit to play out this weekend. And then we're looking forward to Bathurst and probably... Uh, the Drivers' Championship will maybe be irrelevant by then. But uh, who do you like heading into Bathurst? Anton Di Pasquale looked very good as well on the weekend. Yeah, he's had great form, hasn't he? Uh, again, he's this, this, these four races at SMP have been very good for him. They've allowed him to step out of the Scotty McLaughlin shadow. Of course, Scotty headed off to the US to, to race IndyCar. And uh, the pace that, that Anton has showed really tells me that he's here. He's raced well. He's won races. He had pole positions. Um, so he's got to be one of the favourites going into Mount Panorama. You can't, you can't in any way, shape, or form discount SVG as well because he has just been phenomenal this year in the racing that we have done. He, is, he has been unbeatable. And as I say, he's, he's around clear in points. So the odds on chances he is going to win uh, his second championship, so he's going to be strong. Erebus boys are, are a dark horse as well. I think, as I said, if they can keep their pit uh, their pit crew together, they'll be quick. One of the great things about our sport at the moment is that um, on any given day, these teams, any one of these teams, can have a really strong result. There's probably three or four teams that can have a really strong result. So after three weeks at SNP, now going into our fourth, um, I tell you what, you better have, you should have been able to by now really understand what the tyres and what the car will do on the track surface. So we should have pretty close, tight racing this weekend and then a weekend off and then we all head to Bathurst for the what will be our grand final. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Just a word on Jamie Winkup, like you've mentioned, last season. Where will he rank mm. when it's all finished? Oh, he's the GOAT. Seven-time champion. No one's gotten even close to it. Won a couple of Bathurst 1000s as well. Uh, he's a much maligned character. People... He's never had the social adoration that a Craig Lowndes or Peter Brock have had. Uh, he's made some glaring errors over his time uh, in the sport, but you can't argue with the numbers. You know, when it's all said and done, he is a seven-time champion. So when he retires, he will retire as the GOAT. Um, will Will Shane Van Gisbergen catch him? Will a Will Brown catch him? It's all yet to see. But he has been a dominant figure in our sport for over a decade now. Um, he will go out. I mean, he's retiring and he's second in the championship right now to a dominant Shane Van Gisbergen. So um, he is going out in exceptionally good form, could probably drive for the next couple of years, but he has a very busy external business life from Triple Eight and he takes over the, the running of Triple Eight um, into next year. So he's a very busy guy. He'll continue to be a co-driver for the foreseeable future for that team. Uh, but it definitely goes out on top. Now, Matt, we're, we're a bit flat over here because we lost the Adelaide 500, which we loved, and never great when politics and sport mix, but the South Australian Liberal government didn't want it and for whatever reason got rid of it. They've now released some flyers having a crack at Labor for wanting to bring back the Adelaide 500 if they get into power. I'll leave that aside, but your memories of the Adelaide 500 and what a shame it is it's not part of the tour anymore? Oh, it's, it's appalling. Um, it's heartbreaking. Um, I can't. I just can't understand what the government is doing over there. I recent. I saw those mm. recent bits and pieces in the press about the the um, posters that have come out about it, almost insinuating that it's that it's uh, something that will not help with the environment. So I don't get what goes on in the politics there. But it was and always will be one of the greatest races we've ever had in this country. Bathurst, of course, is the top of the tree and I think the Adelaide 500 was was definitely um, a very strong runner-up. I mean, let's be real about it. 
the Adelaide Parkland circuit, um, not necessarily supercars, but certainly its predecessor, Formula One, put, put South Australia on the map, mm. arguably, into a, nas- into a national audience. Um, and then to, to, to lose that to Melbourne, the Formula One Grand Prix, and then to be able to back it up with the Adelaide 500. When we had the concerts, when we had huge crowds, the atmosphere, the opening round, I was fortunate enough to race there a couple of times. And as a driver, it's just the most fabulous circuit. It was a brilliant way to kick off our uh, racing year. We all looked forward to Adelaide. The commitment from Clipsal at the start, I mean, in our ranks, we still call it Clipsal. Uh, we don't call it the Adelaide 500. Everyone says Clipsal, Clipsal, Clipsal. So from a marketing point of view, it was fabulous for that company. I think it's, I think it's appalling that it's gone. Um, th- there are numbers being around, being banded around that it brings, you know, upwards of $40 million uh, worth of economic benefit to the state. And it only cost, I think, 10 to 12 put, to, to put on. I'll be, I'll, I, mm. I stand to be corrected on those numbers, but to me, $25, $30 million worth of economic return to the state plus the international and tourism um, focus that it gets. I, it, to me, it looks like a benefit. I can't believe it's gone. Um, you know, I, I, I won't talk about my political views necessarily uh, on air, but in, in this one instance, I'd be quite happy if the opposition came back in and, and reinstated it. I think it needs to be there. It's a very big event for not only Adelaide, but for the country. So... Uh, whoever gets in next, I desperately hope they uh, they do look at bringing it back. Yeah, no arguments here. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Good on you, mate. Talk soon, eh? Matt McAlden, the host of The Driver's Seat, with all the latest news and information uh, from the V8 supercar scene, including a bit of argy-bargy between Wingup and Van Gisburn over the weekend. And... A disgrace at the Adelaide 500, in his words, not on anymore. Mm. Uh, Nick Kyrgios, very, very controversial. So Nick has come out and said some uh, pretty outrageous things about the Australian Open going forward. We've got the audio of Nick, so let's listen. Well, I just think Kyrie, Novak, I've told you guys this, I'll say it again. These guys have given so much, like sacrificed so much. They've, they're global athletes who millions of people look up to and I just feel like it's so morally wrong to force someone to get vaccinated but I'm, I'm double vaxxed if anyone doesn't well, know we're all double vaxxed here we're double in, vaxxed. Canberra, in Canberra yeah but I just don't think it's in, like right to just force anyone yet an athlete just you, oh, you can't come play here because you're not vaccinated like I think there's other solutions around it I think to get tested every day in the States, I know they got rapid tests and it's coming to Australia. The, the rapid test for everyone out there that don't know about it is what, 85%? It's like 85% success rate. success rate and takes 15 I minutes. I thought it was 75, so that's why I was saying. And you wait 15 minutes and you get a negative test and I think then you're allowed to play. So he did go on to say that uh, the Australian Open should go ahead. Uh, there's a... This Shouldn't I go mean, ahead. In, in terms of wording of things, forcing players to get vaccinated, no one's forcing anyone to do anything. But fortunately, because of medical grounds and everything that comes with it, that's what has to happen for some of these sporting events or pretty much every sporting event to go ahead. So there's a difference between uh, choosing to get vaccinated and versus forcing, using that word forcing people to get vaccinated. Yep, uh, you're right. I, you know, I'm not sure anyone's going to be taking advice from Nick Kyrgios and he's very complimentary of Novak there after spending eight years absolutely bagging the guy. So uh, sort of got short memories over the criticism that Novak Djokovic, um, sorry, that Nick Kyrgios has levelled at Novak Djokovic. He's, he's basically admitted that he can't stand the guy. Now he's sort of lauding him for his stance now and saying a lot of people look up to him. And that, that's okay if he believes the event shouldn't go ahead. And if that's his view, everyone's got a view. I'm, I'm, that's okay. That's fine. It's what you know, makes our job interesting. Uh, discussing people's views and opinions. But if that is his view, then don't turn up at the Australian Open. But I guarantee you that he will because it's an easy 80 grand for him to make, keeps him relevant, keeps him in the headlines. I'd respect him a lot more if he says as strongly that the Australian Open shouldn't go ahead and he he cites Melbourne's lockdown. I'm not sure why the parallel is there between lockdown and, and not having an event. The world is starting to move on, thank goodness. Then don't turn up. But I guarantee you come January, Nick Kyrgios will be there and he'll give us a couple of highlights and then he'll he'll exit the tournament and he'll be off the radar for another 10 months. Um, Interesting situation, as we discussed all morning with the Suns, losing Hugh Greenwood. Took a bit of a punt, delisted him trying to get back in the draft. What about now with Rory Thompson? 
Can you imagine if he gets drafted, and in particular, <sighs> straight away, the thought process is the Blues are looking for a key defender. Oh, yeah. He's pretty much exactly the same as Liam Jones, just a year older. So Gold Coast have got pick number three. They're not taking him with that. Nope. And then 97, 115. So between number three and 97, would someone potentially take Rory Thompson? And could it be the Blues as a genuine Liam Jones uh, replacement? You could, you could, you, you could do it. I think. I don't think anyone's going to be as up in arms about Rory Thompson going oh, to another club, but it's another, situation. it's another paper cut to an already um, swift array of cuts that this club have left on themselves. So they were hoping to use 95 on Greenwood and 115 or whatever it was on, on Thompson to redraft them. They only had the three picks in the draft, which you're required to take through AFL rules. And now that this Liam Jones thing has happened, it's going to be what's well, going to be a nervous week or two. I would think, up until draft night. Code gives you the stories behind the moments, helps you understand the why of the results, and opens up another perspective on the sports you love. Code, unlock the stories of sport. Codesports.com.au